I'll just say good morning one more time. It is a blessing to give God's Word, to read God's Word, to preach God's Word. Uh, for me, it's one of the greatest, uh, for me, it's one of the greatest, you know, columns that I feel that God has placed on my life. And uh, I don't deserve it. I really don't. But God's been good. He's always good. All the time. This morning, I got up about 6, about 6, uh, about 5.45, 6 o'clock this morning. And most of you, some of you know, uh, but we got goats and we got sheep. And don't ask us why, we just do. And uh, I go out and I, I do the feeding. Andrew usually does most of the feeding, but I, I told him I'd give him a morning off, I reckon, and I went out there to feed him. And uh, this past week, we had uh, two babies born. One was a goat. A day later, we had sheep. One lamb. And as I was out there uh, feeding them, I go in and, you, you know, uh, my wife, she says, she, when she heard that we had two of them born, when uh, Andrew called on the phone, she was like, I don't know if my heart can take this or not. They're just so precious. And she, she loves anything that's furry and that walks. Even if it crawls, you give her a snake, uh, that's a whole new story, and she'll... <laughs> but uh, needless to say, uh, I was out there, and uh, you can't just help but to grab them and just hug them. You know, it's just, I don't know what it is, they just, they're a magnet to a soft heart. I think even a hard-hearted person would go out there and just grab one up and kiss it, I think. So here I go, I want to get them friendly, you know, so you know, you got to get human hands on them and touch them a lot. And so... You know, goats are pretty cute, uh, but I got over that lamb. This is my first lamb that we ever had. That's a little boy. And uh, I think they'd call him Oreo. I'm not sure what they named him yet. But I picked that little lamb up, and it's one of the most precious things I've ever seen. I've had kids. Now, they're pretty. They come out ugly at first until you clean them up. <laughs> no point intended, Andrew. Just say it. <laughs> But when you look at the little lamb, I can't help but to think of how precious the Lamb of God is. How He'd sent His Son Jesus on this earth. A spotless Lamb, a spotless Savior to wipe the spots that this world has, the spots of sin. And that is one of the most precious things that a Christian could ever experience is the salvation of their soul because of the Savior. With that being said, let's go right into Scripture. If you will, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. By the way, uh, I think uh, Andrew's got some pictures of those lambs and uh, that goat if you want to see them later. Just don't hug his phone, please. You might get jealous. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound of from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all those who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Now, let me, set this, let me get the setting for you. It is the day of Pentecost. This is the beginning of the church. 
This is the beginning of the church. And what has happened here, there was, there was a group of Christians, they were all in one accord, in one place, at one time, just as Joel had uh, prophesied before that in the last days, God would pour out His Spirit on all flesh. And so now this is taking place. They're all in there, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit has poured down, and they start speaking in another tongue. Now, I know some preachers have preached that this was an angelic tongue, but I don't really believe that whatsoever. I don't believe it was an angelic tongue because when you look down here in the Scripture, you find that there were other men, devout men, from every nation under heaven, and they heard these sounds, and they heard their own language. They heard their own language being spoken. That would be like having like four or five different uh, races sitting in here speaking different languages, and then when they hear some people, whether they be praying, in another tongue, but they all heard it. So if you was uh, had one person that was, uh, uh, if everybody spoke one language, like say Greek, and, and you're sitting here listening to this, and all of a sudden you hear the English language come out, and you're like, oh, wow, they're Greek. Where did this come from? And then you hear the Spanish guy behind you hearing it in Spanish and, and so on and so forth. It's what has happened. is God's Holy Spirit poured down, and a miraculous thing has just happened. A miraculous thing has just happened. See, what was happening was, was the Word of God was being spoken through the different languages. You see, this is point one. It doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, what race you are, whether you're poor or rich, the gospel is for every single person. Every single person. And what we find here, this is God's Holy Spirit has been poured out. So therefore, what this is saying is, God wants to see every single person, no matter where they come from, come to Christ by faith. Notice, this is the church. And this didn't stop here. This continues to happen throughout every generation. Even our own church. That's why you've probably seen me over the years or over the time I've been here uh, as I preach, that I preach for us to go out and share the gospel of Christ. See, we get the gospel when we step in these doors here at the church. They get the gospel. I've heard the gospel preached here many times. But if they don't come out into the church, then we've got to go out into the world. That's our job. When Jesus asked Peter, he says, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. He says, that I shall build my, my church on. That I shall build my church. The church is built on the gospel. So in order to continue building the church, it takes us going out and sharing the gospel. It takes us Reach it out to a lost community and bring them to the place where they can receive Christ. We ain't us that do the saving. Okay, we can't save every single person. We don't save nobody. It is our job to tell others about Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit's job, as you see here, to touch the hearts of people. Let us continue to read. Parathians, Medeas, and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, in Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya, adjoining Syria, Visitors in Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, They are full of new wine. 
You know, there's always that one when people are seeing God work amazingly, there's always that one person that is just negative. You ever notice that? There's always that one person that is so negative. Because right here it says, others mocking said, they are full of new wine. I don't know how many times I've seen God work in people's lives and somebody else come up, oh, well, well that was just because, that was just an incident. People got a tendency to look at what God does and try to find another reason for it. But I want you to listen to what Peter does. There's got to be a man that steps out and shares the gospel. Look what he does. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, God, that, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my manservants and on my Made servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heavens above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever calls on Christ shall be saved. So at us, as a church, as we reach out into a community and share the gospel, if there's any there that calls on Christ, they shall be saved. They shall be saved. And our point is not to go and see other people get saved, but our point is to share the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit that does the saving. And so Peter is beginning to preach to these people. And listen to what he says. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose of the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. See, what's happened here is Peter's beginning to share the gospel of how Jesus went to the cross. How they've turned him over and they give him over to the cross. You see, what we find here is that God is not prejudiced. He's not prejudiced toward any soul, any person. The gospel that Peter is preaching, he's preaching to the very men, the very men that heard all of those whispers in their own language as the Holy Spirit was being poured out. To all men. Not to just some. Not to those who are rich. Not to those who are poor. To, but to all men. To all men. And he's preaching the gospel. Even to the crack houses. <clears throat> How could you say that? Them heathens up in that crack house. But let me tell you a story. There was a young man who grew up in a household with a, a stepfather who did cocaine. And his stepfather would stay gone for four days doing cocaine. He was in a broken home. His mother was uh, going through three jobs, working hard, trying to keep things going. Didn't have a whole lot of time. He run, uh, started running wild when he got older. He ended up doing drugs himself. And then he turned around and ended up selling and peddling drugs. A heathen. A heathen. Peddling drugs. Living the lifestyle that's 
Just ungodly as all get out. As far as you can go. Doing all kinds of other things. Hanging out with the wrong people. Doing the wrong things. The same thing you see out here in this world. You think that person deserved Jesus? You think he deserved Christ? Well, he continued and continued on. And eventually, something came to his heart. It's called the gospel. And he had heard the gospel, and he had heard the gospel over when he was a kid. But as he sat right in a parking lot, he gave his life to Christ. He remembered the gospel. He remembered what he heard. And all he said was, he said, God, here I am. Take me. Do what you will with me. No matter what it costs, I am yours. And that is the same man that stands before you this morning telling you that there is nothing too hard for God. You can go find the wickedest person you could possibly find and with the blood of Jesus Christ, he can still turn it all around. If he can save a great soul like me, he can save you as well. He can save anybody in this community in Winston-Salem. I know before I come here, I prayed, I said, God, and we was kind of like in a church that actually uh, fell through. It didn't even keep the doors open long. And I asked God, I said, God, I said, would you please put me in Winston-Salem? Oh, well, I'd love to take the gospel into Winston-Salem and share the, share the gospel. Shake the foundations of Winston-Salem with the gospel. Not because of my will, not because of what I can do, but because of what he can do. And I asked him to do that. Lo and behold, I end up here in Winston-Salem at Connick Baptist Church. I was sitting here thinking a while back, I said, God, what have you to do with me now? You got me here. Now what? Now what? And then I got to thinking, well, I asked him to put me here. And he's put me here. So now what? It's 2019. It's time to get to work. I'm here to work. I just need a church that's going to back me. I just need a church that's going to back me. And I'll be honest with you, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm... Uh, Pastor oriented or not, but I know I'm evangelistic oriented because that's what he's called me to do. He called me to preach the gospel, to share the gospel with the lost world. So in hopes that they come to Christ so that when I die and go to heaven, I can see those come with me. I love it when my son, whenever he was a little kid, I mean, he was in first grade kindergarten, I can't remember. But uh, he went in and he got so excited. Johnny Fry, I know he's preached here before and you, I know some of you may know him. But he, he uh, fired uh, Andrew up one day when he was a little kid, and he said, now you're going to be my evangelist in the children's church. You're going to be my evangelist. So he takes his evangelism, he takes his Bible, he takes it out and he shares with people inside the class. And uh, the teacher uh, uh, tells him, she says, honey, she put her arms around him, and she's trying not to cry. She says, honey, I, I don't think people believe uh, quite what we believe. Uh, so, you know, and uh, he goes, but well, I think it was Miss James, was it? Who's that? Chillers, Miss Chillers. Miss Chillers, uh, she, uh, she told man, he said, Miss Chillers, he goes, I just want people to go to heaven with me. Little kid got it figured out already. Little kid got it figured out. Why? Because the gospel. He's doing what the church has been called to do. To share the gospel. So yeah, can we get to the crack houses? Absolutely. I'll go if you back me. I'll go. I'll take people with me if they want to go. Because I'm going to tell you, God said He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will go for you, before you, and He'll come right in behind you. So I'm not scared of anything. As long as i got God on my side. And neither should you. But I want you to notice. I want you to notice something. As he's uh, preaching the gospel, and I love it, right here he says in verse uh, 31, he says, He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ. See, he's talking about the resurrection now. He even went from past, he, he's talked about the Christ on the cross. He's talking about uh, burial. Now he's talking about the risen Christ. He's telling the full gospel. He ain't leaving nothing out. He's telling it all. And listen to this, Re resurrection of Christ that his soul has not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. 
This Jesus God has raised up from which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see and hear. For, the, for David did not ascend into heaven, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus Christ, the, the, the moment He rose, the moment He arose, the moment He went down, He defeated hell. If my Savior can defeat hell, He can defeat any enemy that I have out here. Any. All i got to do is just take Him with me. And the only way you take Him with me, you ask Him to go with you. As a church. Now I'll fast forward. I want to show you something that this is part of my favorite part of this story right here. Let's go down to verse 40. And with many other words, he testified, exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. 3,000 souls were added. Why? Because God decided that He wasn't going to pick and choose who come to Him. He was just going to share the gospel and let them come. They were just going to share the gospel and let them come. And those who come were added to the church. You want to talk about church growth? You want to talk about church growth? Let's talk about how many people get saved. I'm talking about people who accept Christ. That's how church grows. That's the secret. I get online, I've looked this stuff up before, especially whenever at Liberty University, you know, you have to go through and look at these websites and they, and they want you to see how you should lay out a website and what's helpful, what's not helpful, you know, what makes a church grow, what doesn't make a church grow. And you can look all this stuff up on how to grow your church. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't think they got it figured out. Because they might win them with a, with a few uh, uh, new things, uh, some few gimmicks, uh, a few shows or whatever. But those who are added to the church, who stay with the church, are those who get saved. Because you'll find out in life that as people come into the church, they may stay for a little while, but then they kind of feather out. And you might see them another couple of times, but then they feather back out. See, those who accept Christ stick with the church. They stay with the church. And if they do fall out, we have a church that goes and gets them and brings them back in. But notice, those who were saved, those who were saved, 3,000 souls were added to them. Verse 42. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, it's the, it's in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, in the breaking of bread and prayer. Those that were added stayed. In the apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread. That's what we're doing here this morning. That's what we're doing here this morning. We're, we're going to break bread. We're going to take communion. We're going to do what Christ has called us to do. He says, do this and do it in remembrance of me. We're going to remember what Christ has done for us. But how much greater would it be if every single pew in here was full of people? Not for the con oak, but for the church, the people, breaking bread. This is what I urge for this year. In 2019, let's start by gathering together in prayer. Let's start gathering together in prayer and start praying for the lost souls of our families. Let's pray for the lost souls in our community. Let's reach out to those in our families and in our community. And 
watch God's Holy Spirit be poured out. And watch God do something in 2019. Are you hearing me? Can I have the, the musicians to come? Please. I know I might be running just a little over. I was always told it was better to ask for forgiveness than it was permission. I'm kidding. But I want every head bowed and every outcome for long. It's the start of a new year. I feel like God's laid it on my heart to make a call. Is there anyone here that's just tired? Doing the repetitive, same old, same old in church. You're tired, they're, they're wanting to know if there's more to life than just the Sunday service. Someone here that may not even know Christ. You don't want to leave here today not knowing who the Savior is. There's people here that can uh, sit down and they can share the gospel with you. Show you what, who Jesus really is and what He came to do. If you're here and you say, I'm not going to call you to come to front or anything like that. I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand. If there's anyone here who would like to see God move in their life in 2019, would they just lift their hand up? Praise God for those hands. Praise God. God can use you if you let him. I'm going to pray a prayer right here. And we're going to take communion. God, you see those that raise their hand, they're saying, hey, do something with me in 2019. I want to be more than just someone sitting on the pew, but I want to see God move in my life. God, those people right there that raise their hand, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you touch each and every person's life there. God, use them. Use them in a mighty way that makes them sit back and say, wow, there's no way I could do that. That was you, Lord. That was you. Father, I pray that you touch those lives. Use them. God, give them an avenue so they can run down it for your name, for the glory of Jesus. And for those here who's not for sure what God would have to do with him. Father, I pray that you reach their heart. Father, I pray that you, yeah, yeah, you squeeze on it tight so that they can see that when they do great things for you, that there are such great blessings in living underneath your authority. I ask this in Jesus' mighty name, I pray.